Half man, half hermaphrodite. That's the dream. <laughs> when you go say go fuck yourself, I'm like, yes! I got that! <laughs> this is Mark Bell, we're at Super Training Gym. And today, I'm honored to be in the presence of another great athlete, great coach, great friend, and one hell of a doctor. He doesn't really like the doctory side too much. Doesn't like to talk about it too much, but he is very smart. We're here today with Dr. Kelly Narnett. You know, I just woke up like that, so yeah. it's like, you know, you're, you're all strong. He's big, he's handsome, he's smart. Uh, yeah, it's always good to be at Super Train Gym. We're gonna do some deadlifting today. Um, we're gonna see if he's, uh, you know, see where his technique is at, see where his strength is at. So we're I, see I, just, I just at came out of about seven months of hard aerobic training, where I was training like four yeah. or five times a week, trying to get ready for this six and a half hour, excuses, 50K race. But the idea is how much have I lost? And so, you know, probably nothing or a lot. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's interesting to, as you get older to peel off like, hey, I've got this base fitness, let me go off and explore yeah. and come back and, rebuild yeah I was only deadlifting to maintain position right but now I'm like well I'm sort of greedy again I think sometimes though when you worry about any one thing too much that that's just as dangerous as not doing it hardly at all like you get so submerged in it and you're so focused in on it that you almost do too much well I couldn't wait to come back and deadlift. That's yeah and now you're hungry yeah absolutely and so you know if you you'll probably be within just a few percent of some oh, of your better you're deadlifts. The best friend I know yeah because I make the lifetime PR was with you yeah. at Super Train Gym yeah. and Chris Bill on the camera. That's right. I'm just saying. It's the combo. It's How like much was that? We had what, 525 hundred pound chain? But this is, uh, this is what good friends do. A lot of people don't always understand the relationships that uh, some of us have and that we're fortunate enough to have. But this shoe right here that I'm wearing right here and the shoe that he's wearing right there. My favorite shoe of all time. Is because of him, largely in part due to him because he um, was confident enough that I would be a good match at three pop. Look at those quads. He was confident enough that myself and Jesse Burdick would be a good match with Reebok, and he just uh, was kind enough to introduce us to Reebok, and then we were off to the races uh, making a power thing shoot with them. So forever, forever grateful for that, and it's just uh, great to be able to share information with uh, somebody like Kelly Stratton. I got to tell a story. I just got back from Europe, and I was like, Julia, what shoe am I going to take? She's like, well, it's hot. And I was like, well, I really love these shoes. They're my most comfortable shoes. She's like, you can't just wear them around with shorts all the time. You look like an ass, right? All the time. Because <laughs> they're high top. Right, because they're high tops, right? But they're so comfortable. John so I, Unitas rocked it. High top. Back in the day. Unfortunately, my name does not rhyme with Unitas. So <laughs> we go to Europe. I wear some other shoes that just destroyed my toes, destroyed them. <laughs> and the whole time I'm like, fucking Juliet, you <laughs> wore my high tops. It's Instead, I just destroyed my toes, these shoes. Yeah, everything's always your wife's fault, right? You gotta always blame it on her. Well, she is smart. She's gotta get the heat, right? All right, let's see what we got here. Some of the uh, bracing that he's doing before he's going which you now hear pretty much everybody talk about again. This guy right here is responsible for that. He's responsible for people rolling around on the cross balls and uh, doing a lot of mobility stuff uh, before they get into their workouts. And a lot of this stuff has been crucial to some of the new, uh, new uh, world records that you're seeing set all the time now. But when you're trying to set up for a deadlift, it's really, really important that you're not just you know, haphazardly bending down and, and trying to lift the bar you know, if you're trying to lift from this position, that'd be the worst possible thing that you could do. It's going to be very dangerous for your lower back. You're not going to have much longevity that way. So the reason why you sometimes see, especially when guys are going for really big lift, they'll get up here and they'll, they're doing all this crazy breathing and it, you might not be sure what's going on because you might not have seen uh, some big deadlifts up close before. But what people are really trying to do is they're trying to fill their stomach up with air. And they're just trying to brace themselves. I think Kelly has a decent analogy for it, and it, you would need a much stronger position than just this, but it's a good way to look at it is trying to brace your stomach for, for a punch, basically, is what you're trying to do. And we had Chad Wesley Smith here who squatted 937 pounds. He basically wanted me to try to fill up my stomach with as much air as I possibly could, and I failed miserably. I was not able to even come close to the capacity that he was able to. Obviously, he's a larger person, so he's dealing with a different set of rules than what I'm dealing with, but he was still able to pull a lot of air into his stomach. And some of these things that you just think are 
just form related or just technique related are actually a skill that these people are learning, isn't that right? Yeah. You know, one of the things we've been doing is uh, we've been toying with light deadlifts on an exhale. So exhale all the way and then show us that you can actually, your mechanics still are stable and robust. That's exactly what you talked about. Without any air. And what you'll find is you're like, holy crap, that I've been using that air to compensate for positions. Right. Right. And we want to we want to basically put as much air into a, a confined container as we can. Right. To create as much pressure as we can, right, and that's one of the advantages you have with a belt versus no belt. I don't know for the belt anymore because I don't need to be going for the big weights. Right. But what I can tell you is, you know, that position doesn't change whether it's pressurized or not. But right. the pressurized position people get confused on a little bit sometimes. Obviously, we want you as much air in the right. system as you can, which means where you're breathing it, where you take your breath at the top, at the bottom. Yeah. Are you just pulling into your face? Are you just pulling it into your chest? That's right. And you, you really want to kind of fill up. If you look at currently like the best batch of deadlifters on the plant they are all squeezing the bar off i mean it's right. violent yeah. because you're putting so much tension in going yeah, the pop off the but ground. they're not jerking anything off wait did I, <laughs> what wait. i don't know i don't know what happened something weird happened there um but yeah anyway it's it is a skill to try to get that air uh into your stomach and to try to create that pressure so the only way to learn a skill is to practice it over and over and over again and make sure you're doing it correctly and make sure you're not always trying to do it with a million pounds um, the breathing that you just mentioned, um, you've seen that used in other sports, different types of breathing in other sports, maybe let's say like swimming, they do some sets where they hold their breath, uh, MMA, There's some of the guys train with the mass or some guys uh, will intentionally uh, have like their nose closed while they're like running. We're doing this thing called, uh, we look at, it's called mechanical ventilation efficiency. And one of the problems actually... I'm so familiar with that right? term, by the way. It's just basically saying, hey, we understand Being that your, your aerobic breathing function is some often the limiter in sport. What we're finding is that athletes have huge tidal volumes, but then when they get into a bad position, they, the, the diaphragm doesn't function very well, the pelvic floor doesn't function very well. And so what we started looking at is just the human body as a mechanical ventilator and then asking, how do you improve that? Right. So if you're super stiff and turtly, you just don't breathe in your T-spine, you're gonna breathe in the only places you can breathe. Yeah. And so one of, the, one of the issues around the breathing drills is like, hey, when you exercise, we don't need to choke out the carburetor and make it more difficult to get oxygen, but bringing awareness to how you're ventilating under load and when you're tired, right. huge benefit, right? Because when you're stress breathing, it's all up here when we need you to be able to breathe here and here. Yeah, you might be, you might be having trouble breathing normally during the day because of stress and you may be having trouble breathing uh, while you're sleeping because you're just too big and jacked. Well, it, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> but it's interesting, if you look at the straw man, you know, right now at our gym, we have Kristen Newman, who was second at the Arnold in straw man. And, you know, one of the things that she and I talk about a lot is getting her to breathe more efficiently under load. Right. And that's actually one of the reasons that, like, the 20 rep squat has got to be the greatest thing of all time. So just condition. Show me you that. can stabilize and breathe at the same time. And I don't think people no, realize no, sometimes, that. that's right, sometimes I don't think people realize it's not just about what's on the bar here. It's about showing me you can sequence and practice bracing instantaneously. And then show me that you can actually breathe. You know, I see you pull these big sets sometimes. Yeah. You know, from Matt Vincent, I've been doing lots of sets of 10, just trying to rebuild my tissues. Right. And boy, if I'm behind on my breathing in those sets of 10, I'm, I'm toast. You know? <laughs> you find out how unconditioned you really That's are. Right. And really, it's not about conditioning, it's about your sucky breathing. Dive into the pool, notice the arm positioning. This is Jesse Burning. Nice. Good, Kelly. Yep. Much better push on the second one. Back's flat. Back's flat. Hips are lower than the shoulders. He's keep bracing himself, getting himself tight. And the fourth thing is don't shit your pants. Again. Did you, did you or did you not? Again. No, no, no. This time, no. Okay. Uh, so I came out clear. The yellow, let's check. That's yeah, why I wear black and yellow. <laughs> it's called proof of concept. Black and yellow. Yellow in the front, brown in the back. <laughs> <laughs> my bumblebees. All of these are my bumblebees. Hell, hell of a colorway right there. Pink bee in my brown pants. 
called a superset. The short rest period is called a superset. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta squat down when I pull. You, know, you know? changed when we were shooting, like a year and a half ago, maybe. Yeah. You changed. You're like, hey, Kel, start with a much more knee forward movement. Yeah. One of the things that I, I'd always heard people talk and for about. Conventional, is, you need that a little bit. Yeah, and people had always talked about, hey, get your quads on as soon as you can. And I was right. like, how do you get your quads on when your quads have already fired? Yeah. And what we have done is, it feels a lot more like my Olympic lifting setup, but I feel like I can get my quads into tension. Right. Not in detention, out of detention, in tension. Yeah. Much earlier. I'm paying attention. More upright torso, and it feels instead of pulling anymore, I'm breaking the bar, and it feels like I'm pushing, and I'm able to push much yeah. longer, which is a real. Di and I suddenly I'm like, oh, that cue so that Jesse into says, the floor. pushing the floor, and, and then I pull it in you, pull That's the right. weight and in. That, you. I suddenly I'm like, oh, I think I understand deadlifting now. Well, it has to. I do don't with, understand deadlifting at all. It has to do with your like your your legs kind of just getting out of the way from here. All you're really doing is trying to get them go, to go like that. You know, people shoot too early, which sounds weird, but you want the weight will counterbalance. Yeah, but pe people shoot too early, right? right? Hip comes up, and the idea is to be able to hold that tension so you as, as you're extending. And it, it's really, I think, if you look at all the best lifters, they're using that technique. Right. Knees a little bit more further forward, which is still the strategy we're using for guys who are inflexible. Let those knees run, right? But there's an ideal range where you're really capturing the quads. Right. And I feel like when I'm deadlifting right, my quads are like, that's what's toast. Right. Because I'm so weak. Well, especially when you're doing higher reps, you're going to feel it more. I think for most people, too, they'll have to go toes out a little bit. You notice his toes are pretty straight, but, um, but he's a supple leopard. <laughs> even, as, even, as, even as it relates to sh just pure strength, you're still better off not going for that. Even even in competition, the Russians, <laughs> you know, they don't they don't they don't go to 100% a lot of times. They still might they still might chip away at like PRs. You know, they go from one competition to the next, but it's still not it doesn't look anything like an American's lift, where they just blow it all out in one lift and they nearly die. <laughs> yeah. They always they always like to have room to get better. You know, Pierce Demas snatched. 175 for like 16 years. Yeah. I mean, he, he went up a little bit in a second, and then he, he would just let, he maintained that level of strength and right. still won gold medals and won and medals. Yeah. Snatching 175 for like 16 years. I mean, just show me that you can do that, right? Yeah, the longevity. Whew, amazing. It's a huge part of it. But Sticky. you know, what we should be constantly doing, and you think you're doing a good job of this right now, better than sometimes we take elite powerlifting and we're like, that's what I need to do to train for football or sport. Instead of saying, what are the principles of elite powerlifting that we can apply to the most people? Yeah. And that's a very different idea. And, and that's durability, that's consistent right. progress forever. But if you, do, if you do three top sets in a deadlift of two or three reps, and a, a bunch of those reps end up going, Brrr. a bunch of those are here. If you're an athlete, how are you going to feel the next day? What are you, you going to be asked to do the next day, and the day after, and the yeah. day after? If you're asked to run and start doing other things, you're pretty screwed, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a couple people that might survive it, but most won't, you know. You know, and there, the other the aspect I think that gets lost, sometimes we're just saying, hey, get stronger, get stronger, get stronger. And sometimes, hey, let's get fitter. But we're also teaching positions, really explicit positions that become default. And under load, I think they become even more set in yeah. stone. And so, you know, practice, the, the neurobiology of this is clear. Practice makes permanent. Yeah. And so you have to also be looking at what is the goal. If the goal is to lift the heaviest weights, and I don't really care if I black out and go unconscious yeah. once in a while maybe. Right. But if the goal is to practice mechanics that I know translate to a flat back in the scrum yeah. or you know, something else, that really matters. Scrum. Scrum. You know, it, it, it's uh, amazing because we just take it for granted because we've been lifting for a long time. You see other people lift, you hear about 1,000 pound deadlifts and 1,000 pound squats. And you kind of forget an extra 225 pounds on your body is, is a lot. You, know, you forget these external loads of any kind. Anything above 100 pounds starts to be, 
challenging for a lot of people, you know? And the more that you can challenge yourself, uh, the better off you're going to be. But it doesn't always have to be with more weight. It could be with less rest, more reps. I mean, there's slower tempo. There's tons of ways to do it, right? Even uh, just getting your heart rate up between. You know, we just did a, we just had a bunch yeah, of physical therapists. Between your deadlifts and die. We had 25, <laughs> yeah. And you will. Yeah. We just had 25 uh, therapists at our gym talking about squatting as rehab. And I was like, they were like, well, do you always have to use load? I was like, well, no. I can get you on the airdyne and make you vomit and then show me that you can do that squat yeah. 95 pounds. You know, there's a lot of ways to challenge it. And I think sometimes we just, this is, this, we're slave to this because yeah. this is such an easy metric. <laughs> and it's fun. It is fun. It's a lot more fun than doing a burpee. Uh, well, it depends who you're doing burpees on. <laughs> this is the half diaper. I didn't go full diaper yet. This is half. Full diaper, we'll show you later. Full diaper, ready? Do it, do it. Full diaper mode. Everyone in here does this, I don't know why. On their heavy sets they go full diaper. Because it feels better. I guess. <laughs> That's why I try to start my shorts a little shorter. Well. Maybe it's maybe it's for the fans. <laughs> for the crowd, for the audience. No, the, the big ass fan doesn't really care. It's to get uh get more bears. Ah, cha cha cha. Keeping your positioning on the floor. It's a good. It's almost like you just didn't take the slack out. Yeah. No Come tapping, on, no tapping. Don't tap him. There we go, three, four. That's fine. Oh, man. Swim for you. People ask a lot of times, how far do you set up from the bar? Well, it's really just a comfort thing. Let's not, let's not uh, make it too complicated. But if you really don't have much of a starting base, you don't even know what's comfortable to you. If you're not very mobile, you may need to back away from the bar a little bit. Or if you're 6'3", you may need to back away from the bar a little bit. Ish. Because he's gonna allow his, he's gonna have his knees travel forward quite a bit, which is gonna change the shin angle and the bar is going to be very close to his legs when he sets up. So if you look, he's got, he's right in good position there. Right when his uh, shins touch the bar is a good cue for him to get everything tight enough to be ready to pull from there. And he's ready to rock and roll. So that's kind of how you determine how far away you are from the barbell. If you are a smaller lifter or you're super mobile, you might be able to creep right up on the bar and get close. Main thing is that when you do set up, that when your shin comes forward, you're not kicking the bar forward as well. You're just touching the bar, 
making a little bit of contact with it and you're ready to slide up your legs. As far as the sumo is concerned, <clears throat> I think in general terms, the feet need to be pointed out on sumo because I don't know how you're gonna get your leg out of the way enough. There might be somebody who's, you know, some people might be mobile enough to have them a little straighter than where I got them here, but you're gonna to wanna to get a little closer than the conventional stance, which would probably be about here. It's kind of cutting my shoe in half when I look down at the barbell. It's right at the midpoint of my shoe, I'd say. Right about yay. And then the sumo, it's not even really that much of a change, really. It's just that I have my foot pointed outward. And I like to try to think of it this way, trying to think about having your legs kind of swallow up the bar. And for me, I'm not very mobile, so I gotta do it one leg at a time. I gotta really think, plant this foot in here, and I wanna try to drive all this out. And if I'm gonna get any burns, it's gonna be almost on the inside of my leg, a little bit more on the calf, almost in the shin here, rather than where I used to have them all banged up on the, in, on the outside, or right on the shin there. They swallow it up here, swallow it up here. Jesse Burdick does a really good job of this. Dan Green. Um, guys with uh, big quads, big hamstrings, they're able really to squat the weight up. For myself, I have to use a little bit of a combination of my lower back uh, and my quads. Guys that are really good squatters are gonna be able to be in a real nice upright position and try to squat the weight up. You aren't on a specific goal timeline plan. Right. So you bench heavy a couple days in a row, yeah. right? And I think sometimes for those of us who lift to make ourselves a better life, we get really pedantic and caught up and I can't do that today, versus showing up and being like, we're gonna do it. Yeah. And even if your volume comes down, right. even if, you're, if your weights are smaller for the day, you should be able to jump in and yeah. train every day. Just a few years ago, when Eric's photo came to the gym, I had no idea who he was at the time. He came to the gym and he started warming up and I was like, what the fuck is going on? He benched 405. It was just, it wasn't like he pumped it out for 20 reps or anything, but it was just so flawless. I think he did about five reps with it. And I was like, I have, n I have never seen that before. I've never seen anybody move weight like that before. So right away I was started doing some math in my head. I'm like, okay, that guy benches minimum 600 pounds. I don't know what the hell is going to go on today, but I'm going to just, I'm just going to train with him. So I said, once I saw him do the 405 for like six reps, I was like, you know, what are you doing today? He's like, well, I worked my way up to like a heavy double. And I was like, heavy double, that's what I'm doing too. I'm going to party right with you and I don't care if I pass out well before here or get crushed. He ended up doing uh, 635 for a double. I think I did 525 or 515 for a double. And when we got done training, he said, all my years of training, you're the only person that's ever done that. You're the only person that said, hey, I wanna just, I wanna just do what you're doing. I don't care if I get killed. Because to me, I always, kind of, I always think, I'm not the best in any of this shit. There's plenty of people that are better than me, but if I'm gonna get better, or if I wanna try to put myself in a position to be some expert or guru, then what good am I if somebody says, oh yeah, Mark Bell, he came to my gym, he saw right over there. You know, we've had people do that in here before. Oh yeah, I remember that coach. Yeah, he sat right there. He was, yeah. What did you think of him? He, he sat over there. You can't have that. As a coach, you gotta, put, you gotta be battle tested. And that's you too. You're doing these deadlifts. You're a doctor. You got a lot of other shit going on. You got a lot of great things going on in your life. So you I, can sh I can show up and look short and weak anytime. I got yeah. this. Yeah, you're 6'1 if you're lucky. Come <laughs> on, oh, let pitch. Let's go. Yeah, the first one felt better. First, first, best first pull you've had of the day. Yeah. Nice job, Mark Bell. Felt good to do all that without a belt, too. Thanks for pushing that. It felt good. You have a couple of uh, 
a couple of uh, things that can help solve uh, a few issues that I see in a deadlift in terms of uh, mobility. Um, people just having trouble getting in position. The most common thing that I see is people starting with a rounded lower back. I sometimes hear the excuse of, you know, they'll say, oh, my arms are too short to get the back flat and be a good pulling position. What are some things, is it coming from the Achilles? Is it coming from hamstrings? Is it every combination thereof? Well, you know, the easiest thing we see is that your normal range of motion is you should be able to keep your back flat. By the way, what he considers normal range, can, can you reach I can it? consider like over, over mobility. No, no, no. <laughs> this is just, just baseline humans, right? And as, as you get stronger, you're going to get stiffer. That's, right, that's right, absolutely the right. case, right? But the idea, though, is, okay, if that's a full window. I remember he was showing me something one time. He was showing me, like, full range of motion. I was like, that looks like hyperextension. He goes, no, Mark Bell, that's full range of motion. I was like, hey, hey Mark Bell, <laughs> these are your feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when we usually see the reversal in people, they're missing hip flexion, the ability to bring the knee to the chest. And what's happening is that they, as they end up, they're looking good, looking good, looking good. They hit this spot and they're actually starting to smash in ah, and, and it hips. forces it. It's a mechanical rounding. This is not tight hamstrings, to be very clear. And so any of the mobilizations we do, we try to improve hip flexion. Right. And you can do a couple things. So I think one of the things that we see a lot of when people pull is they pull and knees get soft and back breaks, right? right? And this, this sort of, this drifting, happens and one of the reasons it happens is because I'm missing that hip flexion I'm also not very strong at creating the torsion right I have said it a million times but the throw a band around your neck throw a hip circle on and just take yourself through some deadlifts and what you're gonna see is you're gonna have to keep your hip engaged through a full range of motion right. so just monster walks means, means you're gonna be strong in this range but we need you to be able to keep the torsion the stability the spreading the hips through the full range. But how, many, what I, how many reps are we talking about there? Until you feel like you're starting to get burnt, right? You can't yeah. warm up enough. 20, I mean, 30, 40 Your reps. best lifting, lifting happens towards the end of the session, yeah. right? right? So we really want to get people there early. But what ends up happening is, you know, because you're missing hip flexion, you're, you're going to do some things to try to get out of that range, right. and you've got to be able to bring the knee to the chest. A simple test is you should be able to get your knee past 90 degrees. How am I doing? Like balance first of all yeah look past 90 right with the bottom leg pretty straight you should be able to get past yeah, without 90, tilting back too without much. doing much tilting but if you can get to That's 90 terrible, right? if you, no if you heck no if you can get to 90 we don't have any more excuses about getting you to the bar because right. at, at some point I've got 90 plus then I just need to run my knees forward I cut you off a little bit before how much should we have the downward motion with the spine there when you were bending down for 90 degrees okay you should be able to hit so you should be able to get your your Shoulders even with where you're yeah, hips roughly are. Well, you know, that's a, that's a good rough guideline and okay. and if you and some of it is you know One of the some of the things that we see is that guys can't relax their hamstrings to the top bend your knees Come back in tension from the bottom. I mean, I think that's that right. works fine But the the main reason that people are reversing is either they're super overextended, <laughs> right? And then that means you're Turn sideways oh. Bam. <laughs> And what you're trying to do <laughs> that's is a good look you're basically taking your pelvis and slamming into your femur early Moneymaker, can you grab a, a band and a hip circle for us? And what we see, though, is a lot of the pathology out of the weightlifting community is junky old hips, right? That, that is very common. And so being able to clear that mechanism means that you don't have to go as wide. So one of the reasons, the advantages of sumo for all of its pulling right. effects is that you basically are taking the hip and unimpinging it. So your hip has, it's going to be closed, it's going to slam in a little bit more here. Right. Here you got a little breathing room, so moving your stance out a little bit can make a difference. You'll see that some of the old guys pull in the frog position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They felt strong underneath, yeah. but they unimpinged the hip in that position. You know, so We're cleaning up the hip flexion makes a huge difference. So I see this happen with a lot of lifters, and uh, hopefully I don't, <laughs> I don't end up in this category too much, but I see a lot of guys walking around with bent knees, and bent elbows to the point where they're kind of like kind of waddling around like this what what is causing that I mean especially if we think about it like uh, in some basic terms a lot of times we, we think we're doing full range of motion of the exercise when we're doing our bench presses and we're doing our squats and our deadlifts how are we how are we kind of sitting on our hips here and our elbows are bent well, two, two I, one idea around the, the, the elbows is that if your shoulder is aimed here in the socket 
your head of so your kind of rolled forward. The head of your humerus is like imagine that this is hold that end. Yep. This is the total length of your biceps, right? Okay. Especially the long head. And if my head of my humerus, my arm, sits in front of the socket, this is what's happening. So right. as the shoulder comes forward, I lose physical length. And it's really difficult. Like I can't really straighten out my elbow in this position, right? When my elbow, my shoulder I've, is back. And that's amazing that he mentions that. I've had that happen when you and I were discussing some of my big bench presses back in the day. I went for an 887 bench and I got stuck here, but it wasn't just stuck here. It was actually stuck here. And there was absolutely no way to lock that out. That's right where that lift fucking finished and I never got, was able to get credit for it. <laughs> and that, and that's, that's the problem, right? So, yeah. I mean, there's a training effect where guys are just moving and not, you know, cleaning out, right? right? And re reclaiming the position. But most of the time we're seeing this and then that uh, does lead to a tissue adaptation. Right. The guy who's doing a really great job of this right now is Big D. Super D is using Donnie his, Thompson. Donnie Thompson. His, you know, he's, he has been advocating compression around the joints forever. Yeah. Right, especially the joint, and then he's been using these 135 pound weights he calls the X Y. Yeah, and really getting in there and taking that much tissue tension and time under load to straighten some of those adaptively short stiff yeah. tissues. That is a fantastic technique. And then down in the hips, is that just again a kind of the shortening of the well, hip flexor? Yeah, you're seeing the same thing. Is I get short hip, and remember you and I talked about that. Uh, you know, so I see it all the time, like kind of a soft deadlift lockout. And guys aren't even getting credit for the deadlifts because they're not. You know, they're not locking their knees. Yeah, well, there, I think there's two things going on. I think sometimes when we see guys who are struggling to get into a flatter position, they're using the psoas to pull on the spine. Where's the psoas? I hear people talk about so, it all the time. God, it's weird. It's like, <laughs> is that a tasty take? Yeah, 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 yeah. Psoas is, the, is basically the quads of your spine. And I call them the high quads. And they attach from the, basically up through your diaphragm, all the way down parallel through your lumbar spine, and then they insert it inside your leg here, right? So it's, big, it's the flame and yellow of the human What did you just point to there? the filet mignon of the human being. So what ends up happening is that if you're rounding, then your body's gonna to try to eliminate that and ends up yanking on the psoas to drag the dragon extension. So now as I pull, my psoas is keeping me in, in extent, keeping me in neutral extension. So as I stand up, I can't finish. Right. Which is one of the reasons why we should be taking and some of the best lifters in the world, I think, are being a better job of optimizing their spinal position instead of getting to the bar yeah, yeah. and trying to unround into tension because we're introducing a whole bunch of shear. And if you have to jump from that position, then that's so as short. Yeah. I think the other thing is you're saying is that, you know, if we're lifting and squatting at no time during your training cycle, has your hip come into extension at all? And so you become adaptively short. Right. You know, this is the problem of saying, hey, lifting is just enough. You've got to be spending some time right. working and lunging, working, doing out the Bulgarian split squats. I think Getting that's some, how they started that. Right. That a little bit of soft tissue work. That'll work too. Just open it up. Right. But what ends up happening is, you know, you get short here and then you're sitting in your car and you literally can't finish because yeah. the, the anterior capsule, the front of the capsule is too short. So, um, you know, something like uh, Jill Miller has uh, that ball. You can kind of sit on and yeah. roll down. Jill's ball is think, think for the average person. Okay. It's going to be great. You need more tension. Yeah, and you need a little bit beefier with for kettlebell or what Donnie Thompson work has. Right. Any, any, any you know, like supernova, uh, soccer ball would be great. And then if you just absolutely hate stretching, despise any form of doing anything like that, then even just the Bulgarian split squats. That would be great. Lunges, yeah. step ups. Even some static, static holds yeah. at that end range to open Couch up. Couch stretch, which is in your yeah, book. Yeah, that would be great. So but I, I think that we're just seeing that guys will get short. The other thing is that you'll see in the older guys who have been hanging on those joints for so long. I mean, Louis Simmons fractured his back, what, twice? Allegedly? I think like 11 times. 11 times? 11 to 70. But that, that this overextension is what broke his back, right? Hang on, hang on the joints. So as we become extension sensitive, by bring, and I see this in a lot of my volleyball players, knees forward, <laughs> takes out all the extension load out of my back. I'm good to go. Yeah. My back feels great. That's basically like walking around like this, right? Yeah. Well, it's amazing because we're always talking about kind of refining position, you know, uh, with the different movements that we're doing. But a lot of the things that you uncovered, at least for me, that I started to learn and started to see more of uh, was people just not even having any general idea on how to walk, how to stand, how to sit, or the, how to get in another car. The, the impact that their life was having on their training, yeah. right? Because we're, right. not, we're not moving around enough. 
we just don't even we we're, we're, we're not going through ranges of motion. Like we made that joke that like like when's the last time you literally squatted deep and you're like uh, <laughs> yeah. Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, it's gotten below parallel. That's yeah. right. And back when we were wrestling, it's probably yeah. like because it's easy to not to be training and not keep your eye on the whole thing. And and even though let's say this is the full spectrum, right. you need this much spectrum to win a world championship. This is where most people are living, right? So right. just giving yourself a little more breathing room, even if it's, you're working towards yeah. full positions. I think possible. you mentioned like a football player, you know, they, they get dragged down by the side and their knee comes in. And these various things happen to them. They shouldn't only have, this shouldn't be the end of the range of motion. They should have a little bit greater than that, right? Well, to be able to survive some of these collisions you know, and things. You know, you had add on, right? And, um, you know, I think you took a fall one time. Yeah, yeah. Right? And well, and that's also. Uh, so when I fell with 1,085, um, part of the things he was discussing with me at the time before I ever fell was that I was missing internal rotation, which is my knee, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, with my knee coming inward, right? That's right. And you kind of mentioned to me that because I was losing some of that, that when I go to go out, Can't. that I'd be missing some of the pieces there, and that's exactly what happened. And what ends up happening then is if you fall then and get out, you should be able to have that range. Right. And if you don't, knee's going to be the thing that yeah. buckles and that's where we start to see all the, the, the new silliness. Right? Yeah, and by the way i was totally fine it only took me like three months to heal from that <laughs> and, and several years actually but mr miyagi best defense no be there just don't fall with 1085. so he's going to show us he showed us before on many different uh, channels and many different spots but we'll just show you again because we always have to inundate you with so product. i sat with uh I sat on the boat in a outrigger canoe. Don't name canoe. drop. Don't name drop. Don't do, it, canoe. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do this it. This is this is what I prepped yep. because this hip this hip flexion position, I think people are really weak in. They don't. They were not really good at this end range, and we see a lot of crazy drifting that happens. This is the number one warm. We just had uh, some Olympic level players come in, who are the best in the world, and this is their warm up. This is part of their plan. Just hooking up. And the key here is I get the chance to really make sure that I'm not flaring the ribcage or flexing. And then I, all I have to do is press in. I don't have to go super crazy knees out. Just keep the, watch your feet so that your arch doesn't collapse. That's a collapsed arch. And just take That's yourself a huge problem I see through people full spot. range. That's right, take yourself through a full range of motion. Maintain the arch position so you don't collapse. Keep pressure on the band and then cycle back up. And it ends up being just the absolute greatest warm up of all time. What you're gonna find is you're like, oh, now I'm training that hip to say, in an isometric position through right. full range, which is what we've got to do. This this is one of the most important pieces of our tool towards resolving ACL dysfunction. This is it. Do you think it's okay for athletes to come in if, if they're scheduled to deadlift for the day, just to come right in and start deadlifting as long as they're kind of warming up with the bar? Or do you like to see people think about it a little bit more than that? Well, I, I think ideally we should be able to use our pre-prep or pre-game or pre-lift time to warm up, right. which means I, if I know I have some restrictions, I'm gonna go hit them quickly. I'm not gonna do any soft tissue work, we we'll say that for afterwards. But if, if I know I, like my hips are grizzled, but today, yeah. what we did was start just taking some warm ups, yeah. right? And yeah, I think- you moved, you moved your leg around a little bit, you did a little bit of uh, active stuff. Yeah, I just did some squats, I yeah. moved around a little bit, and then we just took our time getting into it. Right. And I think that is a complete use of time. I think people aren't doing enough warm up sets. Right. You know, I, I think, you know, even Dave Tate was like, hey, you know, three sets of 10, yeah. you know, five sets of 10, 10 sets of 10, whatever it takes to start grooving the pattern. Yeah. You are really skilled, could come in and probably lift this cold. Is right. that the best thing for your tissues? No. But I think, you know, there's a lot of silliness that goes on yeah. instead of really spending time talking about So technique. maybe like almost go real old school with it and uh, you have things like calisthenics and people used to talk about just like actually warming up, like physically getting your body a little bit of a sweat, almost yes. like a boxer. They used to say, oh, so-and-so is gonna get probably knocked out because he came out and he's dry versus the other guy coming out being right. ready to go. Going cold, come out cold. That's what I was <laughs> to say. So I, I really think, I think you wanna raise the tissue temperature up because right. you're gonna do better. Let your nervous system come on board. Rolling around, if you need to, if something's super grisly, go hit it for a minute or so. But use your time to, to appropriately get prepped. And that, I mean, you can, I don't think you can do take, for the average person, we can't take to be warm sets. And uh, for soft tissue work, it's probably better to do a little bit after the training session because you're already warm. You're kind of slicing through it like yeah. butter, right? Well, you know, and I, I like what the Russians say. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the Russians a lot today, but you know, if you leave the training hall stiff, you're gonna be stiff. <laughs> so when you leave here, yeah. you shouldn't feel stiff. So if your little back is pumped out, or you know your hips are a little tight. Right. Now you're now's the time, and also the soft tissue work brings you back down. 
you know, you used to talk about, you're like, hey, I huge squat days, I couldn't go to sleep. A cool down. No one ever talks about that anymore. Right. That's old school. Well, you know, how about this? They do it in swimming. So most of, swimming most of us, yeah, they warm up and cool down way more than they actually train. Most of the time, we all have thought about playing sport. And if you remember playing sport, like football, how much actually scrimmaging did you do? Right, uh, not much. Not much. How much? How many drills did you do? Yeah, shitloads. So the work sets should yeah. be our scrimmage, and we should be doing drills yeah. and drills and Maybe drills like and drills. 80, 20 or something. 80%, right? Maybe 60, 40. Yeah. So you right. know, but, but the idea is, you know, we came in and scrimmaged today, right. but I don't think it necessarily has to be that way for most people. Hey, good game. Good game. Shirts or skins. Take a knee. I think we're on the same, I think we're on the, that's right. I think we're on the same team. Look, team, team sweaty ass. Team blue. Well, it's because you're too <laughs> cheap to have AC in this gigantic facility. Why am I so cheap? The more money you make, the cheaper you get. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Mark Bell. All right. That's uh, some training with uh, Kelly Sturett. Really appreciate him being here today. Hopefully we'll get him on the power cast soon. We'll get his wifey on the power cast soon. We're going to uh, celebrate my wife's birthday today. And that's it from Super Training Gym. Strong ship in the West. Bitch. Bitch.